Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We are dedicated to creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, and every way that you can define diversity into the education, uh, economic mobility, and leadership pipeline. And we do that a number of different ways. We have an annual conference, which uh, is virtual over 10 weeks this year, our second year in a row, but will be live next year in June in Denver. And we have many programs for first generation to college students, leadership building programs so that they can build their, their personal and professional skills and be connected to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs. We also have summer bridge and college programs with several of our college partners. And every year we do inclusive leader awards across 15 industry sectors, because we really believe that until the DEI experts are widely known as uh, sports stars and movie stars. We're not going to have the kind of um, diversity standards we need for all of us to be able to do a really good job. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the woman who is going to be leading the session today. It's um, Dr. Glenda Glover, and many of you read her story when we were celebrating Outstanding Women um, for March, International Month of Women. So. Uh, Dr. Glenda Glover is one of the most uh, well-degreed persons that I've ever met. Uh, she is extremely accomplished. She holds a CPA, an MBA, a PhD, and a JD, and multiple other titles, and including president of AKA International, which is pretty amazing. And she is the president of her alma mater, Tennessee State University, which you'll see in her backdrop there. So we um, want to share one quote that she shared when you all read the interview, which is, you must learn at a higher level and go beyond what is expected. If you learn at the same level as everyone else, you have to depend on the law of statistics to get you selected. But if you learn and excel at a level above others, your achievement and your performance gives you a platform. So... Dr. Glover, we are so glad to have you here, so honored, and your incredible panelists, and uh, delighted to have you on this really important topic about how the um, Morrell Colleges, the 1890 Colleges, are going to help us really recover COVID strong. Thank you very much. I'm just delighted to welcome everyone to this panel as we discuss HBCUs, the 1890s, our land grant universities leading innovation and inclusivity and ingenuity, especially this post COVID world. We have an exciting panel today. We have two land grant institutions, uh, North Carolina A&T and Alcorn University. We have the founder of the PhD project who has worked with HBCUs getting doctorates. We have an outstanding student from Tougaloo College. So we are honored to have you to each be a part of this panel and to share your very valuable collective insights. So we're going to discuss this COVID rebound and where we are as well as our expectations for the future. So let's welcome this panel. And I will ask each panelist to introduce themselves in this order. Dr. Martin will go first, Dr. Nay will go next, Mr. Milano, and then Ms. Rogers. Let's start with, let's start with, with the, the Honorable Chancellor. Chancellor of a and Thanks very much and good afternoon to all of our listeners and participants. Uh, absolutely delighted to be a part of this conversation and certainly to Carol Carter and Global Minded 2021. Absolutely appreciate the invitation to be a part of this wonderful group. My name is Harold Martin. I'm Chancellor of North Carolina A&T State University. This is my 12th year and I can only say that 12 years have been um, a blur uh, but they've created just remarkable opportunities to engage with uh, exceptional colleagues like uh, President Glover at Tennessee State and, and my dear friend, Bernie Milano. And I've just been delighted uh, to uh, recognize that the important conversation we'll have today hopefully will be beneficial to all who are listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Martin. And you know how much you mean to the HBCU presidents. Uh, nationwide. So we're just happy to have you join us today. Thank you. And next, I don't think our second panelist has joined yet. Let's go to Mr. Bernie Milano. This, this is an institution all in, in, of, in and of itself. And he's done for HBCUs. It's just remarkable and, and just unparalleled. 
So without stealing your thunder, let's go to you, Mr. Bernie Milano, and, and let's introduce yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm thrilled to be a part of this. Uh, I had the honor of receiving an honorary doctorate from North Carolina A&T in 1998, and I was actually hooded by Chancellor Martin, who at the time was the uh, provost, vice president for academic affairs. Uh, I also had the privilege and honor of serving on uh, President Trump's Board of Advisors for Black Colleges, again with Chancellor Martin, which was a wonderful experience. And I, I had served on that under President uh, George W. Bush for his entire two terms. So I'm really deeply steeped in uh, the HBCU community, uh, believe in it, understand the history. Uh, I'm actually wearing an A&T shirt and I have a an a and mug just to make sure that we get equal treatment with the backdrop that Dr. Glover has there. But I'm thrilled to be here. And it was mentioned about the PhD project. So it's interesting now that I'm working with Global Minded as the chair of their board, which is really about first generation college students. Uh, but the PhD project was about trying to get more African, Hispanic and Native Americans to become professors so that when those students go to college, they, they would see people in those positions and therefore they would be inspired and encouraged uh, to go forward. So it's, it's the saying of you have to, to, to see it to be it. So the first generation college students coming in uh, will have a much better chance to have greater completion rate if we can diversify that faculty in the administration. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to be a part of this program. Thank you very much. And we appreciate your, your commitment to HBCUs. And we know that as founder of the PhD Project, what you have done to help African-Americans uh, obtain doctors and work through the PhD process is so phenomenal. And we were so thrilled to have you join us and you can talk through that with us. Now we're going to go to you, Cece. Introduce yourself and tell us about you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Cece Rogers, and I am a upcoming senior here at Tougaloo College where I major in health and rec with an emphasis in community health. Um, I'm originally from Montsway, Mississippi, which is known as the Gulf Coast, near the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Central. <laughs> um, but after college, I plan to continue to have a career in basketball and become a life coach and a trainer. I really want to work in the health realm with people and to have like an impact with people with health and a well-roundedness in it as well. Well, thank you. And you have three college presidents on here and we'll do what we can to help you achieve that goal. Okay, I think Dr. Felicia has joined us. Would you mind introducing yourself to us? And uh, I think I can't see your face yet, but I know you're here. Okay, I think there still may be a technical issue. So we'll, we'll move to our first question. So I'm going to start with you and ask you first, uh, Dr. Martin, you answer first. Let's answer in this order. Dr. Martin, Dr. Nave, Dr. Uh, Dr. Milano, then we'll go to UCC. So here's the first question is, what do you see as the impact of COVID on the institution you represent? And what is the way forward? What do you, what do you think will continue from COVID? The Martin, impact of COVID-19, Martin, COVID I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. The impact of COVID-19 um, has been significant throughout our nation and throughout the world, as uh, we're all aware. And certainly here in North Carolina, uh, all of our UNC system campuses were expected as part of our conversation as a collective group uh, to open our universities uh, this past fall 2020, uh, after having closed in mid spring semester in March. And fully virtually uh, as we were beginning to fully understand uh, COVID-19 and its potential impact on individuals and collective groups. Uh, and simply uh, put, because we were housing lots of students in higher education and residence halls, in dining facilities and in classrooms, that college students were at a high risk of infection. And so we pivoted to fully online focused on opening our university in fall 2020, fully online, fully face-to-face uh, -face and operational uh, this past fall. And we have done so throughout this year with a significant level of 
planning, wearing masks, social distancing, extensive sterilization of facilities, classrooms, meeting rooms, and all aspects of our university. As it turned out, um, uh, we had to engage in very significant levels of innovation like most institutions of higher education uh, through hybrid levels of instruction, some face-to-face, -face, some online, uh, and a high percentage of our students, uh, as uh, Dr. Glove, you know, our students want to be on our campuses. They want to be in our communities. They learn best in those modes. And so our students wanted to return to our campus and return to Greensboro, North Carolina. And so we made provisions for them to do so. But we had to do so in a very healthy uh, and safe mode, not only for them, but for our employees as well. So we engaged in a high level of testing on a weekly basis. Uh, most of our residence halls were full except two. We use those for quarantine spaces when we diagnose students uh, through our heavy level of testing uh, who were positive. We quarantined them, but we continued their level of education so that they could uh, stay on track, stay on point. We put lots of support around them, but we also house a substantial number of our students through virtual learning. So we had to pivot with lots of services online as well advising, registration, bill paying, uh, counseling services, access to library resources and the like. All of those investments of new technologies, new processes, new systems emerged from the innovation of our faculty, and our staff and our students. We were very fortunate to be able to operate fully uh, throughout the entire year without pivoting fully to online instruction as many universities throughout the nation did. We learned a lot. Uh, our students were heavily engaged in support for our university and our staff. High percentage of our faculty and staff also moved to teleworking. Now, we have learned extensively high levels of stress and anxiety and how we support our students, how we support our faculty, the investments we've had to make uh, for our university. Uh, there were significant financial implications for us because of um, certain levels of occupancy in our residence halls, even in our dining facilities. Uh, and the tuition rates for our university are a little different for uh, in-face instruction versus uh, virtual instruction, if you will. So we have revenue reductions uh, for our university. We were very astute in managing through those, uh, through um, operational um, reductions, but ensuring that we are still able to meet the expectations of our students and our faculty and staff, the quality of engagement. But we also look for various ways to ensure that we kept our employees in place. We were not able to, we had no expectations of laying people off, furloughing employees, reduce, reductions in compensation, et cetera. And we were able to do that throughout the year. Going forward, all of the lessons we've learned now, we're put into tests as part of our planning for opening fully operational this coming fall. We would expect to be as close to operation similar to fall 2018 uh, with face-to-face -face instruction, uh, most operations on campus, faculty, and and staff employees predominantly on campus, hosting and engaging our students in a very healthy and progressive way. We will still do that though, with a level of mask wearing, social distancing, with some levels of modification as our state now continues to come from under uh, strict rules of operations as we are engaging in the deployment of the vaccines, we are seeing more and more of our citizens adhering to those expectations. We are a state that's beginning to gradually open and we expect all things uh, continue to work as they are. We expect as all businesses look to open more aggressively as we move through the summer months and ready for the fall, we expect to be fully open operational in the fall. I'll say more about that at a later point. I appreciate that because 
you probably know that you became one of the model institutions um, about you know the academics and the student services and the financial services and how you employees nobody was laid off. So North Carolina A and T became one of the some models that the other HBCUs would follow. They looked to to see what you were doing. <laughs> so we we have something to follow. So we appreciate all of this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Turn back now, Dr. Milano. I know you were not at a higher education institution since you were one of the influencers. So I want to know what you think about that. What was the impact that you can see that COVID has had on, on, your, on the programs you've been in, in, you've been with, the, especially the PhD project? And what is the way forward that you can see? And what do you think is going to come in, in, in the future? So tell us about that. Sure. Uh, I mean, one of the things I, I witnessed um, was number one, the disappointment um, that existed uh, that existed for students who were entering college. Uh, they had these great expectations of what college life was going to be like, because I'm involved with a lot of organizations that are dealing with college students and, and high school students for that matter. Uh, and they're so excited now, to, as you know, uh, I think about 15 to 20% of students were deferred or decided to defer uh, coming to school for a year. And that's, that's an impact that COVID has had on the students that were applying to start in September of 2021. Because if you do the math, uh, only 85 or 80 or 85 percent of the typical open slots for freshman classes were available. So this year's high school graduating class that had a virtual experience almost the entire year, uh, obviously with all of the mental health issues and disappointments they lived through uh, not being able to celebrate that last year of their, their K-12 education. And then to be faced with the fact that uh, only 80, 85% of the slots that should be open for entering freshmen were in fact open. Uh, one of those results was that using the Common App, the numbers of applications going to schools, my heavens, they were up by 10,000, 15,000 students, which I, I, I thank God for not being in charge of enrollment management at universities <laughs> because it's an impossible, impossible task to go through that number of students and, and sorting through who, you know, who can make your community stronger by, by being there. So the impact, uh, it's a little bit like the, the, uh, the physical health impact uh, for, for lots of people. It's going to last for more than just the one year. It's not going to go away because we have, we have the vaccines uh, administered. And uh, it, only time will tell uh, the long-term effect that's going to have uh, on the students that were freshmen but went virtual. Uh, and you know, Chancellor Martin, I think it's amazing what you were able to do in having so many faculty administrators and students experience college the way they thought they were going to experience college when so many institutions just absolutely shut down and everything was virtual. And of course, as we know, uh, you mentioned the PhD project, people get their PhDs, their new faculty, they thought they knew what they were going to be doing when they became professors and were in front of the classroom. But then they were told, no, you're going to deliver your materials in a virtual environment. And that's not something they learned in their doctoral programs. I mean, it, it's, it's tough enough for the more seasoned professors to make that, that pivot, but uh, for the brand new, newly minted PhD, it's very, very difficult. But we're gonna come out the other end. We're, we're gonna be stronger. We, the things that we have learned this last year, year and a half are gonna be, many of them are gonna be carried forward and actually make our delivery process stronger than it was. Well, thank you very much. And I want to, I want to tell you, uh, at Tennessee State, what we've done, there is not unlike what was happening in North Carolina A&T, because we had um, maybe, I think, a weekend or so to adjust to, to, some online, to online learning. But it wasn't as difficult as it could have been, because at the beginning of the semester, we made sure each faculty uh, had a shell. They dropped in their online approach. That's been done for years and you know semester and semester. So this really was really helpful. And so 
academically, we had to make sure that nothing was compromised and no academics were compromised in this process. Of course, the students got a little antsy at times. They wanted to do things, but you know, we just it couldn't be allowed because we had to make sure safety, security, those are your primary issues, uh, you know, in addition to the academics. And so we had to make sure that we managed the elections online, to do classes online. Everything was virtual. We all had some things that could not be virtual, like the clinicals and all of those, but for the most part, we were 85 to 90 percent virtual. And and I commend the faculty and I commend the students on how well they adjusted to it. Um, so so I, I thank you both for those two perspectives. So now I want to ask you, Cece, how do you see you know, Tougaloo moving forward from a student standpoint? I know you're not in the, in the upper levels of management in the president's office, but what do you see from a student standpoint? What do you say to them? Um, I can say uh, from a student standpoint, uh, I feel like we were able to see everything, if that makes sense, you know, with us being students. Um, I could say that um, what I saw was like how the, in, the, the pandemic impacted uh, the school when it came to like emergency response to like technology services, you know, a lot of different resources that students depended on and didn't really have a you know, chance to have that at home. So it also highlighted what we lacked before the pandemic hit. I know coming from HBCU school, we come from more of a tradition than like, you know, when my other colleagues or friends, they go to like, I mean, more advanced schools teaching in more advanced way. So I feel like that was very detrimental to students when it came to like transitioning online. And I feel like what we can do now as like a school, like I came up with three things. I was like, we can acknowledge the problem. We can highlight the variables and we can incorporate non-traditional teachings in a traditional setting that creates the sense of openness and creativeness for students. So I feel like that will also kind of help students like bring them back more into like the school environment in a traditional way, like face-to-face. -face. Cause I saw a lot of kids I went to school with and students that dropped out of college like it's not oh I'm just done because you know coronavirus you know momentarily it's like I'm not going back to school which is understandable but then again it's kind of like you know the pandemic being locked up you know being on quarantine like you know that puts you in a place where you like just everything just close in on you so and like another thing I always said too like I think with being in quarantine and also still in school it gave you a minute to just sit with yourself and so a lot of people don't like to sit with themselves and I'm a witness of that. I mean, I, cause sometimes I don't, but you know, I feel like that kind of pushed people to like more of a closed space where they lost all confidence or a little confidence that they did have. And now it's like a lot of people are struggling to get back to a place where they can find, you know, their foundation and what they want to do in regards to going back to college. Thank you. That was presented exactly like a four photo student would present. <laughs> So we outlined the number one, two, and three. So thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, let, let's add to this. Uh, uh, Chancellor Martin, uh, the CARES Act funding and the alumni, I know they played a major role. So were you able to tap into that, the CARES Act funding with the alumni? How, what role did they play in this? We were very fortunate uh, here in, the, in America where Congress I'm working closely with the president uh, and administration and the former presidency uh, and this current president, there have been three CARES Acts, um, uh, HERF funds, as we've referred to them, higher mm -hmm. education relief funds. Three pots of those have been approved by Congress. Uh, within each of them, uh, there were allocations for higher education in general. Uh, and very fortunately, because of our strong uh, advocates in Washington on behalf of historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions, uh, our, our advocates push for additional funding for historically black colleges and universities. So on top of the um, allocations uh, associated with her funds in each of these three relief acts, uh, HBCUs received additional funds. Yeah. These funds have totaled to a fairly competitive level of support that may be used in primarily three key buckets. One is to support our 
and students in general, students like CC, to help them uh, take care of uh, tuition and fees and support services. But in addition to tuition and fees, students have additional needs as well. Some students are young parents trying to go back to school, have child care, uh, housing and other related expenses. And so her funds allowed us to address the critical needs of our students, both tuition and fees, living expenses and the like. And we've used a high percentage of our funds for that purpose. The second allocation was used to support operations of the university where we had to ramp up. Ramp up in additional technology, bandwidth for increased technology, providing technology to uh, students on our campus who were in communities, rural communities where they didn't have access to the internet or didn't have access to um, quality computing, uh, laptops, iPads, and technology like we made provisions for those because we did not want our students to have any level of deficiency. And some of our students uh, who were uh, planning to take courses fully online still wanted to return to Greensboro. We made provisions for those students to come back to Greensboro and live um, and continue to stay in the school. The last bucket of those dollars went to help address the areas of the university where there were losses, loss in revenue and tuition, loss in revenue and fees, dining, housing, athletics, for example. Those revenue shortfalls we were able to make up uh, as a result of the availability of the relief funds through Congress. Yeah. Now, our alum stepped up big time. Uh, we happened to be in the capital campaign at the time. Uh, we had already built out a very strong and ongoing, um, incredible relationship with Aggies all over the nation. Uh, and they were very generous in their incredible support of our university. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the generosity and support of our students. Uh, funds to provide technology for them, help pay for tuition costs and living expenses as well. All we had to do was ask. And they responded in remarkable ways. We were also very fortunate to have just incredible corporate partners and foundations in our region who also went over and beyond the call of duty to assist our institution. So I've said to our business community and our alums uh, and our board, uh, quite honestly, that uh, we will be in a stronger financial posture this coming fall than we would have been had, it, had we had been in a normal mode of operation without the pandemic because of all of the generosity and support, both federal uh, private fund support, uh, but also the generosity of our state legislature as well. And so we are in a very good position. Uh, we have been very innovative in how we invest these funds on our campus. And I'm excited about what this means for us because we've learned so much. Um, I think the other part about this is as well, uh, uh, President Glover, as you know, um, oftentimes uh, faculty are resistant to innovation sometimes with um, online instruction, offering degree programs online. Our faculty transitioned very rapidly and now they are pushing the envelope to move toward more and more of our degree programs, often online, services supported. They're looking for ways to be innovative and creative. We are capturing out of our experiences areas where we know now going forward there are goods and services and activities we will continue in a very different business model post pandemic that will serve our university well and enhance the role we play as an economic driver in our communities, in our region, uh, quite honestly. And so, and that's what the land grant institution um, as a framework for their creation in the first place is yeah. framed to do. And I believe land grant institutions were better positioned and have demonstrated a greater level of resiliency through this pandemic than most universities in general. Well, thank you very much. That's excellent. And when you mentioned the, I thought we had to bring that out, what a role the Congress played in this, the CARES Act funding, how it helped HBCUs. And I have to take my head off there, but all the, 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 the Congressional Black Caucus, I want to highlight your your alum, Congresswoman Alma Adams. I can't say enough good things about her and, and the, the battle that she 
she took on for this. So I thank you for bringing it out. So this question, I'll start with you, Dr. Milano. Uh, what, are some, what are we doing this summer to ensure we have a strong rebound for this fall? What are some of the things that you're engaged in? Then I'm going to you next. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, well, let's go to you first, Dr. Milano. Yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, I, I have the honor and privilege of being associated with Global Minded. Uh, and when you talk about first generation college students and you look at the completion rate, uh, you recognize there's a huge problem. Uh, and, you know, whether it's there's no one back home to talk to, there's no one back home that, that has been through that experience so that when something happens, they don't really know where to turn. They don't know if it's, if it's normal, if it's not normal. Uh, so trying to come up with a program, and I know, I know all the universities have special programs for entering freshmen and freshman experience, but coming up with something in the summer between the, the high school experience and the, and the entering freshman experience, I think is absolutely essential. It's, it's a bridge. You know, I, was, I was talking to one of uh, uh, Chancellor Martin's wonderful um, alumni uh, who's, who's uh, uh, very, very successful and been very generous to the school. And when we explained what Global Minded was trying to do with the Summer Bridge Program, he said, oh, my God, I get it. He said, you're the kindergarten to first grade. I mean, first graders do a lot better in their book of business having been through kindergarten. And that's absolutely right. There's such a delta between the high school experience, firstly, especially for first generation college students, many of them coming from zip codes that are not known to have wonderful preparation and school systems. And then all of a sudden they're thrust into one of your universities that have very high expectations, have very high standards as, as your faculty do. So having that bridge that, that helps them uh, understand how to navigate, understand what the opportunities are, understand how to take advantage of the opportunities and how to navigate that experience, leaving the high school and getting to that, uh, that first semester work is really, really serious. So I'm, I'm thrilled with that approach. I think it's really terrific. We, we actually have tools that have been proven uh, to work. Uh, so we do have a, a track record that we, we can stand behind and say to people, we can be successful in helping, especially the first generation college students uh, better uh, enter that freshman class with a higher level of confidence, higher level of preparation, and a higher level of knowing that the university really cares about uh, their ability to make that transition. Very good. Um, do you have any comment you wanna to add to that, Chancellor Mark, about what you're doing this summer? Um, yes, we sure a strong rebound this fall. We miss you had learned a lot um, <laughs> before that. Yeah, this summer is, is, is a big deal for us. Uh, as each summer is, uh, we normally have a high percentage of uh, summer programs and bridge programs that bring students to the campus to give them a, a head start um, and to just simply get ahead in courses and the like. Our summer enrollment in our first summer session that began Monday of this week. We're up about 25% in um, summer school enrollment. Uh, we've used a, a strong message to our students, uh, use this opportunity to get ahead. Uh, some of you want to catch up, that's a great as well. Uh, we have made uh, financial resources available to them through the institution to enable them to be able to do so. Um, our summer school is fully virtual this summer. And so many of our students continue to have summer internships as well as cooperative assignments. So they're able to do both. They're able to continue their summer experiences through work assignments with some leading global companies and organizations, but while also getting ahead academically as well, of which we're very excited about. And I think uh, sometimes we, uh, you, you can prioritize resources, as you know, in very different ways. We've made our students the center of focus for investments in our faculty and our staff and the technology enriched environment we're creating uh, for the educational experiences. And it's paying dividends for our students and their successes. As um, Bernie has suggested, um, HBCUs in general have high percentages 
of first generation Pell eligible students. And we're no different. And our students uh, love being on campus, being engaged by faculty, staff, and face to face instruction. So we've had to enhance that level of interaction through technology so our students have access to those services virtually. Mm -hmm. We've also ensured that we are providing the financial assistance our students need as well. Uh, we think that's critically important so that they are uh, transitioning to our institution. Um, Cece made uh, reference to um, sometimes there is a um, disparity between uh, educational opportunities and experiences at an HBCU uh, uh, versus non-HBCUs. We've been very intentional at ENT to mitigate um, what our students may consider to be differentials. Um, we have leveled the playing field, the investments in technology, classrooms, smart classrooms, faculty who are engaged, sufficient staff and regular and routine touches with our students in terms of communications with them. We have to mitigate those differentials to ensure that our students have access to uh, comparable levels of quality educational experiences. We've made those investments. We believe that's critically important for the role we play as a competing university uh, as we seek to attract to our university a comparable share of what we consider to be students that drive our enrollment, enrollment growth. And fortunately for us, even in the midst of this pandemic, we've seen enrollment growth this past year. We expect increasing levels of enrollment growth, even larger percentages of growth this coming year because we have to ensure that the CCs on our campus are getting high levels of engagement and supporting services to ensure their academic success. That's critically important to me, it's important to our board. And so and I think that's where HBCUs are finding great opportunities for the future as we've done in the past in providing support for our students. Absolutely. And then speaking of, of students, I'm gonna go back to CC for a moment. I'm wondering, Cece, if you have, well, before I do that, let me ask, Dr. Felicia, did you, were you able to join us? I see your name on the screen, but I don't see you. Dr. Felicia, are you on yet? You're on mute, if you can unmute. Uh, okay, we gotta, we gotta move on. I'm gonna ask you, uh, Cece, do you have a recommendation that you think a possibility of standard practice, I mean, based on what we learned from COVID. Is there some standard practice, some, some um, recommendation that you've seen as you, as you talk through with other students that you come up with that may be good to be a standard practice for us? Um, to kind of piggyback off what Dr. Martin said, like with the first question, with, uh, he talked about with generosity, with like bringing in funds. I think that word by itself is something that uh, was lacking even before uh, coronavirus, because like I talked with a friend earlier, like, you know, when you start college, everything is kind of so business driven, like, you know, career wise. And it's like sometimes, you know, when you have your experiences, you kind of don't experience a lot of generosity with different people. And I feel like as in people as a whole, you know, um, that we have to remember that we're humans too. And sometimes we kind of forget about that, that daily human necessity, like, you know, with emotions and stuff. And I feel like generosity will really bring in a lot of stuff because when you're not generous, you kind of push people into a corner and they don't really want to, you know, be them true selves. And I feel like uh, the standard going forward was being more generous and like creating, like I said, more open spaces, being willing to listen, like, you know, just picking up where we lack at and focusing on where the lack is and trying to put in effort. So I feel like, you know, we use effort and generosity. I feel like we can go far because um, with me being a, a first gen student and being a part of a Global Minded, it showed me a lot like, you know, it made me more open to experiences because meeting uh, Miss Carol, like, I didn't really feel before meeting her, I didn't really feel that I had, you know, what it take to be, you know, a college student. I just kind of was here on basketball scholarship. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes you have to meet people to kind of figure out, you know, 
what you're really capable of and they can bring out the best in you. And I can say this program has done that for me. So now moving forward, it has made me feel like it is my duty and role as an upcoming senior at this school to like, you know, push, you know, the upcoming freshmen or incoming uh, transfers or whoever decided to come to the school and to like give them a sense of, hey, you know, this is home, you know, you can be who you want to be here. And I think that when we put that into perspective, I feel like we'll be able to bring that in. Oh, good, thank you very much. I'd like to give you a little round of applause for that one. So I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Milano, why don't you uh, pick it back up there? What have we learned in this last year that will be standard practice going forward in our institutions? Oh, we've learned so much, I tell you honestly. <laughs> um, I, I think um, I, I will begin first by suggesting that um, having um, smart people on your team who, who work well together, who collaborate in significant ways to solve the challenges of our university. Uh, I have just been overly pleased with the excellence of the work of our team uh, in helping us evaluate and evolve solutions to keep us uh, focused on where we're heading. The other things we've learned are obviously uh, the great needs of our students. We have invited them significantly uh, into our conversations as we develop plans for opening last fall and throughout the year of operations. And as we seek to open our university this coming fall to ensure that we are developing plans that are inclusive of the needs and interests and concerns of our students, but also our faculty and our staff. And so we realized our solutions are much better when we do that and engage in an ongoing way. We've also realized uh, that there are operations that we were, we thought were fairly efficient in the way we were doing them before, but now that we have integrated technology and refining these processes and delivering these services in a very different way, our business model has been enhanced significantly so that the level of interactions with students, deployment of services, engagement of uh, vendors, uh, connections with the campus community as a whole have been dramatically enhanced by the use of technology uh, and a much more in, in, engaged process of uh, involvement with a variety of our campus constituents. So when we look to the future, we will absolutely deplore some of these processes as well. Advisement of students, registration for classrooms, bill paying, um, mental services, healthcare access on our campus, a variety of services that meet the growing needs of a very innovative student population, uh, but also our faculty and our staff as well. Good. So uh, Dr. Dr. Milano, let's, let's, you, let's let you have the last word on that one. Well, you know, I. It, it just hit me, and this might, this might um, cause some people to be uncomfortable, <laughs> but uh, I it think- It never this, stopped you before. <laughs> not, <laughs> I, I, I really think the students who were uh, attending an HBCU had a distinct advantage over the students that were attending what we call TWIs, traditionally white institutions. And, and I say that, you know, I've been involved with higher ed for, oh my heavens, it's gotta be 40 years or more. Uh, but the unique feature, I think the unique, a unique feature of HBCUs is a tremendous nurturing environment, a really caring about the student. Yes. Really caring about getting to know who the student is, what they're wrestling with at home, what they're wrestling with on campus, what they're, what they're dealing with. And, I'll never forget all the times that I've walked down the hallways that I have to go back to A&T and, and have, whether it's the dean or assistant dean or one of the faculty members, uh, stop, introduce me to whatever student was walking past and then saying, and how's your brother doing? Or how, how's your mother doing? Or how, how are you making out with the, the issue you had? But I mean, they really, really care and it's, that nurturing environment, some of it, I guess, is associated with the size, but I think a lot of it's associated with what, what Chancellor Martin said, and that is 
knowing that a very high percentage of the students there are first generation college students. And therefore the whole mindset on, on how, you, how you interact with the student is very, very different from, okay, you got admitted here, you should be really great that you got admitted here and then you know, take your classes. So uh, maybe a little controversial, but I do believe, I do believe that the students that uh, went through this year at an HBCU uh, had it much, a much better tour than the students at the at the. Uh, I think many of us agree with you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think we have one more question, I'm and that is, um, what are some of the the things that's going on now post COVID? Well, not really post COVID, but as we come out of this, that you think will continue, not necessarily an institution, but but nationwide, something things like. Um, uh, telehealth. I mean, what are some of the things you think will may continue that we've learned during the COVID period? So who wants to start uh, with that one first? Uh, I'll start. Um, Thank you, Cece. Um, I can say uh, from like dealing with day-to-day -day stuff, still dealing with like trying to live life through the pandemic, I feel like innovation and being more innovative is going to be very crucial for this country. Um, it's kind of like the way the world is moving. We can't really hold on to some of the old traditions because it's literally like holding us back. And a lot of people don't want to let that go, but it's kind of like, if you want to live in this country and live in this lifestyle, you're going to have to do a lot of compromising. So I think there's going to be a lot of compromising and innovation uh, to keep moving forward. That's how I see it. That's good because... You talk about the number of businesses that have, that have gone, gone out of business, number of companies, and you're talking about the forced innovation that have started businesses the, on the internet and, and other ways that we were in our houses and our distant learning places during COVID. So forced innovation. So uh, Dr. Mario, you were saying something? Chancellor Mario, you were saying something? Well, I, I love Cece's comments. I really do. I and, do. But, but you know, I'd also add to what she's suggesting and when we look at the past year or so of the pandemic and are dealing with it, it has exposed, in addition to uh, the policing challenges with the murders mm -hmm. of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud, um, and, and on and on, uh, social justice and, and policing in America, uh, disparities in America have been um, further exposed to the pandemic, healthcare, educational uh, disparities, uh, uh, unemployment, all of these uh, challenges in our nation have been brought to the forefront. And as we look to the future, I think we are going to have to be much more diligent in focusing on how we solve these um, uh, very significant challenges and impediments to our nation's full realization of its potential uh, when we're not including uh, opportunities for all of its citizens uh, to gain access to a quality of life uh, the, it's per the American dream. Uh, and it is a conversation we're having a significant amount of debate about how we make a difference through our university and our community. Uh, the role we play to help stimulate uh, entrepreneurship, jobs in our community, around our university, in our state as a whole. Um, and we've got to continue to be involved in these conversations. You look at K-12, uh, black and brown children are, are, are big educational gaps that need to be addressed. Absolutely. Unemployment, healthcare delivery, mistrust of healthcare systems, policing in America and mistrust of the criminal justice system. All of these things are before us as we work our way out of this pandemic that also need solutions as we move forward into the future. That will require our best minds, best political engagement, but quite frankly, the best engagement of our young people in helping us frame the best solutions for the future Absolutely. because they will be impacted in a very significant way. And, and Chancellor Martin, I'm so happy you mentioned uh, the, the discriminatory practices, the social justice movement, because I've said publicly that, uh, yes, this pandemic, this COVID-19 virus has affected 
African Americans, um, and they're dying at a, at a faster rate. And not so much because we have uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and respiratory challenges. It's because the discrimination existed in the early years because of the disparities in healthcare from years and years ago. And so that is now coming home to roost. When you have a discrimination at large scale like that, at some point it's going to catch up with you. So this virus exposed that to a much greater extent. If someone says the population is 13% African American, why is it that the, the, the death rate is, is almost 50%? So when I said, you know, you can look at what happened years ago that caused African Americans to have the health challenges that we have now. And so when companies have called and asked, well, what can we do to how can we what can we do in this environment? How can we help? Who should we call on? What organizations? And you start with HBCUs. And you can start with other organizations, civil rights, if you choose if you if you want to. However, HBCUs live in this community. We know what to expect. We can advise you properly. We have a capacity and we know to do what needs to be done and to assist you as you try to come forward with programs and to make progress in your own community. We know what we know what to do. We've done we've taken problems in the past and turned them into solutions. But we know exactly what to do. We're in the right ball game when you come to HBCUs for assistance. So I'm glad you brought the social justice part of it because it's so significant. That, that we keep that going in this, as we move into this declining days of, of the COVID, COVID-19. So, Dr. Milano, I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> well, you know, you know, because we all learned that Zoom can be really powerful, uh, and Carol knows this, we, our church started a racial justice reading group and it has been unbelievable. I am so embarrassed to have read about 12 books since, since we started this, uh, all the years I spent working in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, uh, I have learned so much. And I don't think we would have been able to bring people together. Why don't we meet on Tuesday nights and everybody tries to, has to go to the church and be in a separate room and all. But no, you, you can just sit here and have nothing on the bottom and just something on the top and have your Zoom meeting and have a really rich discussion. And it has been absolutely amazing. But the other thing I want to say that... Um, I guess one of the advantages of being retired is you can be a little bit controversial. The, the corporate world uh, has always said how important diversity is. And oh my gosh, I wish we had greater diversity and I, I wish we had more people moving up the ladder, et cetera, et cetera. So I look at, you know, forget about the fact that we got somebody on Mars, okay? Everybody says, oh, you put somebody on Mars, you can do something about diversity, okay. But think about how the corporate world pivoted on a dime to make sure that they could continue to function and deal with their customers and deal with their clients and keep their economy going and keep their, their stock price up. And because it was a big business imperative. So if diversity is a big imperative, a big business imperative, take it out of the social room, business imperative, which is what everybody says, right? Boards that are more diverse, companies are more successful, et cetera. Why is it taking it so long to solve it? <laughs> and the reason that the answer is, it isn't top of mind when a, when a CEO gets up in the morning about the issues they want their organization to deal with. It should be, but it isn't. So I'm, I'm hoping that what we've seen these last six or nine months, as horrible as they have been, that there is you know, everybody in, in, in our space talks about you take two steps forward and three steps back, four steps forward, three steps back. Let's not do that anymore. Let's take three steps forward, yep. hit that, regroup, four more steps forward, and finally, and it's all about education. It's all about, you know, Chancellor Martin, one of the books we just finished reading was called Wilmington's Lie. When I think about all the students who came through the K-12 system in North Carolina, learning about the history of North Carolina, learning about the history of what they said was a black uprising, race riot, et cetera, which they, they have proven is not, not the case at all. And then I lay on top of that, that your schools in North Carolina, except for the one exemption you have, 
require that 82% of their entering freshmen be from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. now, it, now you in, you infect the culture of the institution and all you have is 18% of the students that may be a little bit of a counterfoil. It's, it's just, it all, it all rests with, and there's all this political controversy about 1619 and you know, they, it's just, it, it's there for the solving if people just get serious about solving it. And I think what you're suggesting is that it's more than just about COVID-19. Absolutely. Uh, it's yeah. significantly more as we manage ourselves out of this conversation. It yeah. is. It is it, you're right, it's much more. I, I, yeah, I'll close <laughs> by saying something that happened in my household. My, I, this is COVID. This is the world we're going to live in after COVID. My husband uh, had, a medic, had a medical exam online, uh, shopped for groceries, and had food delivered, and went to church online all in one hour. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so this is where we are now. This is where we're going to stay for a while. This has been the life of him. I'm going to thank you all for, for joining. I thank Dr. Brenda Milano, who's the founder of the THC Project, uh, Chancellor Harold Martin, who's North Carolina a and uh, We call him president, the, dude, the president of presidents. We love you and thank you. Uh, CC student, Tugaloo College for the boldness and bravery to come on this panel and sit with presidents and CEOs. So Bernie, thank you for all you've done for HBCUs. We, we all just look forward to the, the program coming back to its full force 100% because we need those students who produce them to help us carry on our jobs as academicians. And Carol, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. So uh, back over to you. Thank Carol. you so much, Glenda. And, and uh, Dr. Nave, we'll figure out ourselves a different time and we'll have kind of a follow-up conversation to this. But, uh, but I just wanna thank all of you. And I always say you know, to Bernie, if, if we can be with our first-gen students like Cece, half as successful as the PhD project, <laughs> there'll be millions of students like Cece going out to change the world. And one of the reasons we have a student on every single panel over 10 weeks of our conference this year is not only do we learn a lot from the Cece's of the world every day in these panels, but then someone like Cece knows what it's like to put her opinion forth and to get, you know, maybe work through her fears and all of those things when she goes out and changes the world as a coach or sports manager, or whatever she does with her gifts and talents, she's going to have more agency than if she doesn't have the opportunity to be at the table with the leaders from her college. And so one of the, the values of Global Minded is to really establish, you know, those kinds of norms and structures that haven't been there in sort of the hierarchical kind of patriarchal, you know, mode of old. And now we just, we just know we have to really co-create the, the solution and the innovations with these students, not kind of you know, above them. So, uh, so anyway, I'm just so glad to, to get to know um, all of you so much better and also to share someone like CC and uh, for us to be able to realize too that when students like CC become juniors and seniors, they're some of the most powerful mentors to your incoming freshmen. And we are looking forward to setting up those structures along with people who are business leaders and you know, um, committed to civic engagement you know, as people like Bernie. So we are gonna work with you all on those role models, the mentors, the internships and jobs for your amazing students. And um, really hope that across all HBCUs and all colleges that serve um, students um, who, who are you know, low income or first gen, that they can get the resources that you all have been able to establish. And we look forward to making that happen with all of you. And that's with you too, Cece. So <laughs> just know you're part of that. So thank you all again so much. And we um, will have the recording of this session tomorrow in our, in our newsletter. And then it'll post to our YouTube channel and Celeste will send everybody a thank you with the link so you can share it with your faculty. And I'll just leave with one other thought, which is that one of the reasons we do these sessions and we have monthly equity events led by people of color with primarily people of color attending is because so many of your students can see themselves in these role models that we gather. And that's something very special. We have like 110 you know, different kinds of topics now on our YouTube channel. 
but that's where students can see themselves as doctors in the future or technology leaders or whatever it is they're interested in that we're able to provide those examples and, um, and you all are those examples. So thank you for being you. those incredible role models. And we are looking forward to another session with you all soon. And also seeing you in person the third week of June in Denver next year. So you guys will have to put, put a fence on your calendar right now. Cause I know your calendars book up and we'll see you guys. And you can meet Cece and a whole bunch of other people incredible like Cece and you all can bring your students as well. So, and thank you, Bernie for literally your Bernie's the one who put us all together. So we have to just acknowledge he's the, uh, he's the connective tissue. Right. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the week. And, and thanks to everybody who attended today and uh, we'll get you all the link um, shortly. Thanks Take care. You, you bet. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Take care.